All right, here we go. Week nine nearly in the books, and it's time for another episode of Move the Sticks. What's up, everybody? Rhett Lewis back here with Bucky Brooks as our guy Daniel Jeremiah on the road with the L.A. Chargers, getting set for Monday night football with the Chargers in the Jets from MetLife Stadium. Um, Bucky, <laughs> got to tell you, man, I, you know, I'm sitting here getting ready for Game Day Live, you know, which you've been a part of here. Uh, uh -huh. Game Day Live, six and a half hours, uh, essentially of red zone coverage all day long on NFL yes. Network. Um, and I'm like, in this window, this is week nine, in this window of early games, seven, early, I'm going to see four new starting quarterbacks. <laughs> and week nine, that... It's crazy. The it 46th, 7th, 8th, and ninth different starting quarterback this year. If you think QB2 doesn't matter, think again. My good. Sometimes QB3 matters, buddy. And look, we'll, we'll eventually get to <laughs> yeah. this. But, yeah. but here's the thing that drives me crazy about the National Football League when it comes to the quarterbacks. So much of the quarterbacks we talk about in the draft. We talk about developing them. We talk about getting them ready to play and those things. But then we continue to hear it time after time. Oh, the starting quarterback got all the reps. The backup quarterback didn't get any reps. And so, Rhett, you're sitting here talking about we're, we're up to 49 quarterbacks that are playing, yeah. but we're not getting the backup quarterback's reps when the odds tell us that the backup quarterback is going to play. It doesn't make sense. And I think about Josh Dobbs, who wow. doesn't know the name of his teammates, doesn't know the play concepts. He hasn't taken a snap from the center, and he hasn't thrown to any of the wide receivers, but yet – after a quarter, he is in it's, the game. It's it, incredible. It, 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 is, it is crazy to me. At some point, I just want NFL coaches to maybe go to their local high school coach and say, hey, you know what? What do you do when you have to get the backup ready? Because at yeah. some point, you got to get the backup some, some reps. Just get or, a hey, couple reps. Can we borrow your squad? Can you guys just come <laughs> over here and we'll get Josh on another field with your defense <laughs> and we'll just let him see things? You know what I mean? Because, um, yeah, it's it, it truly is crazy. We're going to get to that Vikings-Falcons game, which was awesome. It was actually a really great game. Um, and, you know, it's kind of – you know, the, the other interesting part is in the early window – it was the games that you weren't expecting to be great that ended up being phenomenal and dramatic. And it was the game that you expected to be maybe the closest and hardest fought and, and hotly contested and the Seahawks and the Ravens. And it was like, dud, but such is the NFL greatest reality show on television. So let's dive right in here, Bucky uh, with the first one. And that's the bucks and Texans. So, you know, that I am mm -hmm. a CJ Stroud believer um, and, and we have, you were on this train too. We, I think we all, I mean, like anybody who thinks that anybody think, who put yeah. CJ Stroud as like their number two quarterback did not think that he was going to be a terrible quarterback in the NFL. Okay. Right. He ends up being the number yeah. two pick Texans did a great job maneuvering all that. Um, but this was, this was something different. This was a different mm -hmm. level of CJ Stroud. Now we've showed you some of the beautiful throws. Uh, we've showed you on Monday. We showed you on Tuesday during our video show too. He's always a popular pick in the fantasy draft we do. Um, but the 470 yards, the vast majority of which came in the second and the third and fourth quarters, right? 370 of the 470 yards come in the second half. Mm -hmm. The four, the five touchdowns in this game, four of them come in the second half. And with the game on the line. Like there were so many terrific throws in this one. Um, I just I want to highlight one or two real quick. Um, we go back to the throw he he hit to Tank Dell, not the not the game winner, but the one mm -hmm. before it. And they've got a little kind of like a little stutter and go happening here with Tank Dell. But the the DB who's Carlton Davis is like ten yards off. So you know, generally when you run that stutter go, sometimes you you want to eat up a little bit of that cushion first, right? So you can mm -hmm. generate some more separation. So Tank Dell has this little stutter and it's like CJ Stroud has already visualized it. And he let, he is already throwing the football and Carlton Davis is still five yards in front of tank Dell. It's just like the trust, the expectation, the anticipation, and then the pinpoint accuracy to drop it in the bucket uh, at the end, man, that was, that was incredible. The last two throws, the deep corner route, smoked it in between a sinking corner and a closing safety when everybody in the yeah. world knew that he had to throw it deep and he still manages to do it. And then the game winning play, he says it's drawn up essentially in the dirt by Bobby Slowick, right? It's a double post and, you know, Tank Dell just widens and then bang. And CJ Stroud is an absolute star and Tank Dell is going to be an absolute star in this league. And those two together, man, Buck, it's something special right now. 
you know, Red, like going all the way back to the draft process, I'm so mad at myself, right? So I'm mad at myself because I've always been a firm believer in CJ Stroud, right? Yeah. Like having having been around him in high school, having been around he him and Bryce Young together on the same yeah. team, watching both of them and watching CJ Stroud just kind of grow and right in front of my eyes. Like I'm mad at myself because during the run up to the draft, there's so much noise and commotion that like it can you can easily be swayed with your opinion just a little bit, right? Not not that going from one to two, yeah. whatever. Because early had him one and finished, he, yep. he finishes two. You seeing him every week in the Big Ten, like all the stuff that you do with the Big Ten and IU, sure. you know, you you got a feel for who he is. <laughs> and so now I'm watching him and you're like, come on, oh. man, this is what he does. You saw it. <laughs> yeah, like this, like this is what he does. He's, we talked about the most natural thrower in the draft. Like he had a level to his game that look, we celebrate and we talk, like we, we talk about all the time. And the knock on him was, oh, he's not athletic enough. He doesn't move around. He doesn't do this. But for the last 30 years in the National Football League, we talk about pocket passers, guys that can deal from the pocket. No one dealt better from the pocket than C.J. Stroud. Nope. And yet we act like we're surprised that he's throwing for 470 yards and, and, five dunnies, and just carving people up. And the scary thing about it, he doesn't even have the supporting cast that he could have. Yeah, like, it's only getting better. So if I'm a Houston, Texas fan, like I'm sitting here like, holy smokes, because we always talk about franchise quarterbacks are able to do the most with the least. If he's doing that as a rookie, what is he going to do when he figures the game out and they give him a couple other pieces? This dude is remarkable. Yeah, because, you know, Nico Collins has is, is been a nice piece and they had chemistry early. Tank was kind of hurt. And then he's now come back. And man, Tank Dell is... Um, I mean, just get ready because mm -hmm. he, he's going to be one of those dudes that we're talking about for sure. And then, look, I, I just, you know, I, I go back to, again, some of the narratives. He, you know, the reports come out about the meeting he had with Bobby Slowick, right? Mm -hmm. And everybody's like, oh, my, oh, this, is, this is going to be bad. Oh, oh, or maybe it's just two competitive <laughs> dudes, you know, who love football and believe in their abilities. And and so, yeah, they're going to maybe take things personally every now and then. But you know what? The fact that I'm hearing now in week nine of his rookie season that CJ's talking about Bobby so confident in what CJ can do, they're just going to draw something up when they absolutely had to have it right in the biggest situation of the game, draw something up and say, Hey, let's just go, let, go run this. And they, and they execute it. I mean, that, that just uh, don't believe everything that comes out. That's salacious in the draft process. That's a big lesson for us. I think. Yeah, that, that is, that is the lesson. When people talked about the S2 test and, yep. and all the other stuff, his personality and all that. Uh, when you talk to the people that, that really mattered the most, what his coaches said at Ohio state, they celebrate, they raved about him. Um, what he was able to do in those big games. I mean, we talk about, and we've seen Georgia give people problems. He carved sure. them up like uh, oh, yeah. a, a Thanksgiving Day turkey. We 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 saw it over and over again. And, you know, it, it's funny because D'Amico Ryans has, has always talked about like him being the guy. But I think when you hear his teammates early in the year, Brevin Jordan and some of the other teammates talk about, look, we got the guy. And yeah. players will always tell you when they feel like they have a magic, uh, a, a magical player at that position. He, he has that. And the fact that, what are they, four and four? They're, they're yeah. close to five. They're 500. Who would have thought the Houston Texans would be a 500 team based on what they're doing? I mean. Incredible. And look, it man, speaks, it's, it's, yeah, it's crazy. It's And, and again, coming that, back to a first year head coach, we're going to move on right after this, but coming back to a first year head coach, understanding what some of the most important pieces of that first year are going to be. One, a symbol of staff you believe and trust. Mm -hmm. And you believe, and, and, you know, again, Bobby Slowick, first time. Now they got to know each other in San Francisco. That obviously pays off, but he's got, he's got good coaches around him. And D'Amico obviously is a terrific defensive mind and they're playing really well. Obviously they're going to want some of these drives back that allowed Baker Mayfield company to get back into this game. Um, but they've played pretty well for the most part on this season. And I think it's, it's a bright future uh, now with the Houston Texans. All right, let's move on. Boy, it was, uh, it was the marquee game of the afternoon slate and, and, you know, arguably the day, NFC East clash, Eagles and Cowboys. And, man, Cowboys lose another tough one, right? Another close one, 28 to 23. Eagles get it done, stopping the Cowboys in dramatic fashion when mm -hmm. they got all the way down inside the 10-yard line. 
uh, and then couldn't quite convert uh, to take the dub. So what'd you see in this one? Look, I, look, if you're a fan of both teams, you really should be excited about both teams because yeah. it's one of those rare games where both teams played really well, but one team came up short. If I'm the Philadelphia Eagles, I'm excited because this is a team that's sitting at eight and one. They haven't even come close to playing their best football. This is a team that's kind of been sputtering and kind of finding a way to win games. They're sitting at the top of the league with the best record. And I would say that if Nick Sirianni had to give them a grade out of 10, he'd probably give them a seven, seven and a half, maybe sure. stretch it to eight. They haven't put together the, the, the epic performance where they've been great on offense and great on defense on the same day. This was a game that kind of went back and forth. Offensively, they, they found a way to kind of score enough points, but Jalen Hurts is certainly hampered by the injury. Um, couldn't get it all the way going with the running game, but made enough plays to kind of put themselves in a position. But then the defense showed up, you know, made some plays, had some splash plays, guys uh, knocked it around, turned it over, came up big when they needed to. The Eagles just know how to win. And coming out of the bye, I think if I am a team that's in the NFC, what I'm fearful of is the Eagles beginning to play the best football down the stretch. This is a team that certainly hasn't peaked too soon. Their best football is ahead of them. And with the Cowboys, look, they, they still, and I think what we're seeing from them, Dak Prescott played great. He had 374 yards. Uh, C.D. Lamb showed up and was Jeez. like a dominant number one receiver. We saw all the things in the passing game. The missing ingredient, though, is the running game. And I'm not We've saying that – We've been talking about it for a couple of weeks now. Yeah, I'm not saying that Ezekiel Elliott would have been able to do it, but they don't have the running game that allows them to control the game. They can never take control of the game because they can't – take the air out of the game when they need to run it and yeah. salt it away and those things. And that could be their Achilles heel. Cause I don't know how they can add to it. Didn't take, pick up anybody in the trade deadline. There's no one out there in the streets that can add to it. Tony Pollard is fine, but I don't think Tony Pollard can be the workhorse back to kind of be the, 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 the runner that they need to play the style that they need to kind of win at the highest levels. Right. And, you know, I think it, it, it's all, Tony Pollard is certainly, you know, worthy of being a, a piece of that discussion, right? Is is it is it because he's better as that, you know, explosive piece, right? Where you can find him the ball, um, you know, outside of the the scope of being the workhorse, um, or you know, is the offensive line not playing, you know, up to its standard in Dallas, which we've talked about the last couple of years, really? So I think, you know, that's the that's another part of it too. You know, Mike McCarthy calling plays this year. You know, how much does that factor in as well? Um, so it, it could be a more than just a Pollard deal, but that is obviously the one that kind of stands out because there isn't the presence of another, you know, bell cow type of running back in that role that we've seen Ezekiel Elliott occupy for the last few years there in Dallas. Um, so I look at that on, on the encouraging side. It wasn't just CD Lamb. Jake Ferguson almost caught 100 yards, you know, from the tight end spot, seven catches and a touchdown on 10 targets. Jalen Tolbert is starting to come on too as another complimentary piece in the pass game. The Cowboys are going to be around. They're going to be around in this discussion. They're not going to mm -hmm. fade away. And so uh, the Eagles are obviously right where they want to be right now, but um, not losing faith in what the Cowboys you know, can ultimately do this season. All right, let's move on. Chiefs and Dolphins from Frankfurt, Germany. Mm -hmm. You know, you had to wake up early to watch it, but early on you're like, huh. <laughs> right? You're like, well, yeah. the, Chiefs, the Chiefs obviously came to play, uh, and, you know, it was the Dolphins – who had spent essentially the whole week in Frankfurt chiefs just came in hot right on Friday and, and they were right. And they came out ready to play, uh, you know, early on both offensively and defensively and defensively here is, is where I want to, where I want to hit. Cause I think Steve Spagnuolo deserves a ton of credit um, the way that he was able to keep the big plays to a minimum mm -hmm. on, on this high flying explosive offense with Miami, I thought was incredible. Um, and you know, you get that, you get some of those big time plays. I mean, that fumble, that Trent mm -hmm. McDuffie forced, man, that is textbook stuff right there. Uh, form tackle going down, strips the ball out. Mike Edwards picks it up, pitches it back to Brian Cook, and you're off and running for a defensive touchdown. You're up 21 nothing going into the half. No, like, I don't know that any lead is safe with the way that Miami plays offense, but the way defensively that they were playing, it was gonna, they were going to make Miami work for it. And they did. Yeah. And I think that might be the blueprint there, kind of like it was for defenses playing the Chiefs the last few years. Make them work for it. Make them be patient. Um, and I still think that this Chiefs offense has some issues to work out, right? Because they are yeah. not what they have been. But defensively, this team's winning with defense right now in Kansas City. That's the thing. And that's kind of been the, the, the thing that no one has talked about for the entire season. 
this is a defensive led team and we are not used to seeing the Kansas City Chiefs uh, play this way. We're not used to seeing their defense kind of make it happen. And the fact that last year they were able to win a Super Bowl with so many young players playing. Well, now those guys have experience and they develop a level of expertise when it comes to playing on defense. George Karloftis and Brian Cook, uh, Joshua Williams, all the young guys that they have playing, they are really, really confident. And we're seeing that confidence bear out. I think the other thing that, that stands out is Andy Reid is beginning to get more comfortable with the fact that, man, my defense is pretty good. We don't have to take any unnecessary risks offensively to win this games. We're seeing Pat Mahomes play more like a game manager than the ultimate playmaker, but it's working. Uh, if the Chiefs figure out how to generate more points on offense, I don't know how you beat them because exactly right, right now their defense is playing so well. Chris Jones being able to control and dominate at the point of attack. We talked about the defensive backfield, the young secondary, Trent McDuffie and, and all those guys. I don't know how you beat them because they took an explosive high act time offense in the Dolphins and neutered it. Completely yeah. took it out of the mix. No big plays. You go nickel and dime it. Did it playing some man-to-man or something. Not this soft zone that a lot of times we see. If they can play this kind of defense, I, I, I really don't know who can knock them off. I mean, they're just a, a really good team all around. And the complimentary ball that they're playing makes them darn near unbeatable. Well, and, and let's also, while we're at it, give some credit to Vic Fangio um, because mm-hmm. – not many guys in this league that can say they went up against the Chiefs, you know, in their heyday, and they held Travis Kelsey to three catches for 14 yards. Yeah. And that's the other thing. Like, if you can, if you figured that part of it out, the Chiefs aren't prepared to beat you in another way right now. That Did that's it. what it and, and look, you take away the defensive score, and who knows what happens. This is this game's going into overtime, or or you know, something else happens down the stretch. Um, but if you can limit Travis Kelsey to three touches in 14 yards, you're going to have a chance to win that ball game against the Chiefs every single time. Because right now, Sky Moore, MVS, Kadarius Tony, and Rasheed Rice, Justin Watson can be good players, but they're not enough to carry the mail offensively. And that's just that's what it feels like to me at this point. No, they're they're, yeah. they're not they're not good enough to. They're get not there down. yet. Yeah. On their own accord. And you're right about Vic Fangio being able to figure it out because the main thing, the, the, the problem where, where people struggle when it comes to defending the Chiefs is what do you do at 87? Because he's such a, a freelancer when it comes to his routes and those things, it's hard when you play in his own to always be aware of him. Are you willing to put man coverage on him and, and kind of deal with all the different problems he can give you with alignments and, and those things? But the Miami Dolphins had a great plan for keeping him in check and because they're able to keep him in check they kept pat mahomes in check one of the areas where the kansas city chiefs have to work on is to counter to some of those things is the running game they weren't able yeah. to run the ball well Good enough ball. or they weren't disciplined enough to do it this team has to continue to evolve and grow if they're going to be the super bowl team uh right. that we expect them to be but the good thing is, while they're trying to figure it out on offense, defensively, they're airtight, and that gives them a chance to continue to stack these wins. And I am not one of those people that thinks that Andy Reid cannot figure it out. Because I think, <laughs> uh, for the most part, we, we would imagine that Big Red and, and 15 are going to find a way to make it work uh, offensively. All right, uh, let's move on to the Bengals and Bills. Sunday nighter, um, they're obviously an emotional scene in Cincinnati, DeMar Hamlin. Based on what happened back in January last year, he was inactive for the game, uh, but certainly active on all the activities leading up to the game. You know, thanking all the first responders, was out to dinner with them, has scholarships now uh, in their names uh, for the good folk, for, for people in Cincinnati moving forward. Really cool stuff, all that happening uh, in Cincinnati. And, and what, a, what a difference, man, a year makes. And so great to see him, a part of that franchise, obviously. Um, but for the Bills and the Bengals here, it's quite clear that, that Joe Scheiste is back. Um, in a big way. I mean, he, he was incredible in this game. The 50, I mean, the, the rushing yards in this game mm-hmm. from Joe Burrow, I think, again, you continue to point to, uh, he had that one scramble for first down where you could see it on his face. He's like, I didn't even think about my calf on that one. And we got a first down, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So like, that's dangerous. Obviously he's pinpoint accurate Bucky. Um, but what, what did you, what was your major takeaway from this one? The Bengals have kind of found their way back. They found their way back to being in the conversation as one of the top teams. Like they've climbed up into the mix where they can be in the conversation where they may not overtake the Kansas City Chiefs as the number one seed, but they're positioning themselves to be right in the conversation, them and the Baltimore Ravens to win the division. 
Yeah. The scary thing about the Cincinnati Bengals is when this quarterback gets hot and when this quarterback is fully confident, they believe and they know that they can beat anybody. And this win over the Buffalo Bills was just another reminder. Hey, guys, no matter what you think about us, we're always going to be here. When he talked, I would say, like, with all the bravado saying, hey, the window is as long as my career is, we're seeing that. When Joe Shiesty is is on his game, yeah. you can't deal with him because he not only is a great pass for his point guard, meaning that he'll get it to anybody and everybody, he has that extra factor of the athleticism to pick up first downs. And the great thing about what we call these athletic quarterbacks is not necessarily that they're running all the time, but, man, when you can pick up two or three extra first downs on – scrambles and improvisational runs and those things it changes the equation in terms of how the defense has to defend you this Bengals team is really really good offensively they're beginning to get together and let's tip our hat to Lou Anaruma oh is, yeah here we go find yeah. a way to get that defense up and going this team is good this team is on the is on the rise on the climb real quick yeah a couple of turnovers forced in the bills you know again like I just feel like it's sometimes hard to put your finger on it with Buffalo um, it just, and you know, Josh Allen maybe said it best. He's like, just, just no rhythm, you know, just could not find a rhythm. Um, and in order to win games, you have to first not lose them. And, and right now they, they do have some critical mistakes that end up costing them, but you never count them out because Josh Allen can obviously do it all. And he's proven, you know, many times, but, but it definitely is frustrating when, you know, your, your team as talented as the bills and you can only put up 18 points, um, in a big spot like that. Uh, and by the way, as we look here and talking about the Bengals, guess who's sitting in the seventh seed in the AFC right now if the playoffs were to start today? Yeah, Ooh. the Cincinnati Bengals. And every team in the AFC North is also in the playoff structure. It goes seven, Bengals, six, Browns, five, Steelers, everybody uh, up there looking at the, the Chiefs at one with the Ravens leading the division at seven and two. And we'll get more. Uh, on that uh, game coming up here in just a little bit. Uh, we're also going to talk about uh, a team, and we'll move into the NFC Conference, where there is currently a team sitting in seventh place that is now on to their third quarterback. The Minnesota Vikings are in the playoff structure right now behind the play of Josh Dobbs. We'll get into it next year on Move the Sticks. All right, welcome back, everybody. Move the sticks rolling on. Rhett Lewis, Bucky Brooks, as uh, DJ is off in transit to MetLife Stadium as he's going to get set for the call of the Chargers and Jets on Monday night. Um, so we're going to take a look now at another one of the dramatic games from the early window uh, of your Week 9 Sunday, which was the Minnesota Vikings finding a way to get it done against the Atlanta Falcons. Oh, by the way, I hate to start this with uh, negativity, but... Um, Kevin O'Connell just announced that Cam Akers is out with an Achilles. Oh, for the rest of no. The Second one for Cam That's Akers. Terrible. That is That's terrible. Awful. Hate that for him. Um, so Alexander Madison uh, thrust even more into the spotlight now. But you know what? That's the theme of this game and maybe of this year for the Vikings. Who's going to step up? Started with Justin Jefferson going down, right? And guess who starts shining? It's the rookie Jordan Addison, uh, who did again in this game. Uh, Jordan Addison, um, you know, continues to play well, five catches, 52 yards, had a big one down the stretch in this game where he was able to have this phenomenal body control to stay in bounds on the sideline. Uh, and then you have, obviously Kirk Cousins goes down last week. Jaron Hall steps into play. Jaron Hall starts this game, becomes the ninth rookie quarterback to start a game this year, which I think is like the most we've had in, in some time. Um, so the ninth rookie quarterback, Jaron Hall, he lasts about a quarter and then he goes down with a concussion. So who do they bring in, Bucky? <laughs> Josh Dobbs. The guy who so started last week for the Cardinals. It's so unbelievable. Well, it, it, and we talked about it at the top. It's um, the, the thing that I am really curious about, and I hope somebody gets to ask Kevin O'Connell about this. But like, what were the, I wonder what that one-sided conversation was like in Josh Dobbs' ear in that earpiece. Because there's no way that he is – that comfortable four days into the playbook to run 30 pass plays. He threw mm -hmm. it 30 times in this game. Yeah. Um, so like, is Kevin O'Connell in there? Like, Hey, um, this is the play, but this is what I need you to focus on. This is essentially the concept. This is what we're trying to get. This is what we're trying to work on. So like tell everybody the play so everybody else knows what's going on. And then this is what you need to worry about. 
Like, do you think some of that is going on in his helmet? Or are you trying to stay out of his helmet to not cloud what's already a brain that's probably going crazy? You know, I I think what they what what they did, and and obviously Kevin O'Connell talked about this a, a little bit afterwards. They they went up tempo so they could get him to the line of scrimmage, and yeah. it allowed Kevin O'Connell to kind of walk him through the yeah. concepts. Hey, look right to left, you drop. Here's what you should be thinking. All those other things. It, look, it's it's a great thing. Um, the benefit that Kevin O'Connell had in working with Sean McVay, he watched how Sean McVay utilized the headset yeah. and the mechanics to help Jared Goff that first season when they were all together with the Rams. He took a page out of that playbook. It worked. And because Josh Dobbs, we know it, man, everyone talks about like how smart he is and, and all those things. Um, he has proven the value in a good backup, a smart backup who's a quick study to go from where he went, Cleveland to Arizona, Arizona to Minnesota. He's done this time again. Last year he did it from Cleveland to Tennessee yeah. and started in the game in less than a week. He knows how to do it. But for them to be able to use – the in helmet communication device to lean on his experience as a guy who's been around the league for seven, eight years to put him in a position to do it is great. And the Minnesota Vikings are going to have a chance to kind of backdoor into the playoffs because if he stays healthy, he is going to give them a chance, not only with his athleticism, but with his smarts, his awareness and that experience, he's going to give them a chance to win games and be in the mix. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's incredible. It really is. And I think, you know, Josh Johnson is essentially the modern day Josh Johnson, right? Yeah. You know, who can come in on a whim, you know, and either be your backup or, or get in and, and try to figure it out. You know, if he has to go out and go in and play. And I mean, like the guy started, you know, what was it? Eight mm -hmm. games for the Cardinals. Yeah. Um, and now comes in and he's ready to rock and roll for the Vikings on, on essentially four days of prep. Uh, again, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty dang incredible. And, uh, you know, I think he, Josh Dobbs talked about it as like, you're prepared to, to go, you know, take a test in Spanish and then you show up and it's in French. He <laughs> did <laughs> AP Spanish. Yes. No, like the hardest level of Spanish. And then taking an AP French course. My goodness. I mean, even his jokes are highly academic. Right, right, right. Fun. Right. Oh, That's what okay. it is. But man, it, it, it just speaks to how tough it is to kind of jump in this situation. Five days in, he's ready to play. And give him credit for being a professional, being able to do it. And he talked about what he learned from Mike Tomlin, that no one cares about your circumstances. They care how That's you right. perform. I love that part. And he was able to do it. He's grizzled. He's hard. I do know this. Josh Dobbs will play another seven or eight years in the league based on just what he's been able to do this year. Between yeah. the calendar year, from what he did at Tennessee to what he did at Arizona to Minnesota, he will be the first backup on call. Congratulations. You are going to make thirty million dollars as a backup quarterback, just hanging around the league. Yeah, if he wants to, I mean, like if he doesn't want to go, you know, build a rocket, um, then yeah, he can go continue to to build up a, a team's <laughs> roster quarterback. It's it's incredible, and and my hat is off to him, man. I the the amount of mental exhaustion that he has had to work through this year, again, going from the Browns to the Cardinals, now the Cardinals to the Vikings, back up to starter. Um, so many different times, I, I think is just uh, to be commended. And remember, like this is a guy who bounced around, you know, as like a third string quarterback for the first like five years of his career, you yeah, know, with been, the Steelers been, and the Jaguars and the Browns and back to the Steelers and to the Browns and to the top. I mean, it's it, again, it's incredible. So hats off to him. Um, and the Vikings are now the seventh seed in the NFC playoff picture. Incredible. And maybe Justin Jefferson is on his way back now. So we'll we'll see on that one. Um, all right, let's move to the Commanders and Patriots. This is a game, Bucky, that the 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 uh, the Patriots were down big early, scored I think fourteen unanswered to take the lead, and then still end up losing to the Commanders. How how did you end up seeing this one? Okay, so it's it's look, and I know that the last two years I should be better prepared when it comes to looking at the Patriots fall short. But it's so odd over the last 20 years seeing how the Patriots are losing these games. And I know people have tried to make the debate between Tom Brady, Bill Belichick, who's responsible for the thing. But for me, when I looked at the Patriots, the Patriots won a lot of games because they just didn't lose them. And the fact that they are now losing these games because it always felt like in a close game, the Patriots find a way to win. They haven't been able to find a way to win. Some of that is personnel driven. Some of that is like the quarterback that they have is not quite as magical as the one that they had previously or whatever. But. I, look, I, I I can't get it. They're not a very talented team, but they yeah. do just enough to hang around 
but they can't get it done. And I look at it's mind boggling. We're going to talk about when he finished his career, Bill Belichick will be celebrated as the greatest coach of all time when it comes to the national football league with the wins and all that other stuff. But watching him pour so much into this team and this team give him little in return when it comes yeah. to the victories. It's really interesting to watch this team kind of just fall apart. Well, here's the other piece of it. I don't know if you saw the news conference today, but he's answering questions about whether he feels like he's coaching for his job this week. Like yeah. you've got Boston media personalities trying to read the lips of Jonathan and Bob Kraft up in the box. Like, what are they talking about? What are they saying? Is it related to Belichick? Oh, I hear I say, it looks like he says, you know, we're just not good enough, which is true. I mean, that, that part of it is true. They are not good enough to compete in the AFC East right now and to be a playoff contender and to hold themselves to that extraordinarily high standard that yeah. they themselves set, you know, over the better part of the last two decades. So um, it, it, it does, like, the benefit of the doubt thing, I think is really interesting with Belichick in new England because mm -hmm. like how much, how much credit is a, what have you done for me lately? Lee, we all know that. Yeah. And what they've done lately has not been great, but they also had 20 years of the best football this league has ever seen. So yeah. what, you know, like balancing the benefit of the doubt thing with Belichick is a, is tough. It, it, is, it is such a, such a weird thing. And I've made this comparison. I've written about it. It reminds me of Greg Popovich and the San Antonio Spurs. Yeah. Okay. So when Greg Popovich and the Spurs, they're winning, they had the three Hall of Famers, uh, Manu, Tony Parker, Tim Duncan, man, they're winning. They win five titles. Everything is great. He celebrated his best coach or whatever. Those guys exit stage, right? Man, they fall apart. They're down at the bottom. You just don't know. But he gets the benefit of the doubt. He gets the grace to do it. Lo and behold, Wimby comes and now the Spurs are back. And now he's the greatest back. So, so the, the thing will be for Robert Kraft, can he pull himself out of the emotional part yeah. that he's in where he's looking at his franchise like, man, we're down at the bottom of the standings. We, we're not getting these wins. We had 20 years success, so I'm so spoiled of always kind of being the team. But does he believe in Bill Belichick, the coach who also brought you those six titles? Yeah. Because if you, if you believe in them, then you exhibit enough patience to let them work through it. Because all the great franchises that have – Five, six titles, San Francisco 49ers, they endured their fair share of slumps. The Pittsburgh Steelers have had some ups and downs when it come, comes to it. Does Kraft have the wherewithal to stay patient with Bill Belichick? And then the other thing with this, okay, if you dump him, who? Then what? Right. Right. You know, who Drew, fixed it? it? Because, because now. On staff, is it, do you right. want a complete break from it, everything? I don't know. I don't know if I'm there yet. <laughs> on on trying to think of Belichick replacements, I just tell you, I, I just I feel like there's still something left there um, that he'll try to figure this thing out, and maybe all he needs, all he need, apparently all he needs is Wimbayama. So I guess he, <laughs> he needs one. He, needs he just has, he has so to figure out he has to figure out a way to get one. Like well, that's they, the keep, they keep going down this path. Caleb Williams will be available for them. Um, you know what I mean? I mean they've got two you, wins right now. You spent some time in Boston. Do you think that Caleb Williams would be a great fit in Beantown? Do you think the Boston fans will love Well, winning winning is a good fit in Boston. And <laughs> uh, I feel like above all else, they figure out a way to embrace uh, Caleb because he, he is a winner um, outside of the last few weeks at USC. Although I don't know that that's all his fault, but that is a podcast for another day. <laughs> Let's... Let's move to the Ravens and the Seahawks briefly here, because this was a just an absolute dud. Um, credit to the Ravens defense. They are playing like mm -hmm. early 2000s Ravens defense. Like that's mm -hmm. what they're that's the way they're playing uh, right now. I think they allow some of the fewest yards per play. Um, yep. Genevieve Clowney has given them a real nice boost. Kyle Van Noy has been a terrific pickup. Credit Eric DaCosta for what he's done with mm -hmm. pickups in season the last couple of years. Um, Justin Houston, you know, a year ago gave him a nice boost. Um, you know, he found a way to uh, find some guys. When all the running backs were down, they found a way to stay afloat. Um, and that's kind of been the case again this year. And lo and behold, they found another one. Mm -hmm. East Carolina's Keaton Mitchell, undrafted free agent, who, by the way, I was looking at this because I was like, where, where in the world? We didn't talk about this guy at all last year in the draft process. And, Look, comes from East Carolina, uh, you know, team that, you know, 
is a group of five team, doesn't, you know, win on yeah. the national stage very often. But this is a guy who had 200 carries last year for the Pirates and averaged seven yards a pop. So, like, again, you know, this kind of relates back to the conversation we were having about Stroud. Like, at some point, like, if you see it, believe it. Right? Yeah. And yeah. you understand level of competition and you understand measurables, but with running backs especially, doesn't production matter? It it does it does matter. And it's funny, we're talking about East Carolina, easy yeah. you, as as they would say, <laughs> where I'm from, because a lot That's of right. my high school classmates made it down to East Carolina, okay. G Vegas, as easy. they were talking about Greenville. Yeah. It's a nice, nice fun school to get some academics and a lot of partying in. But they play good football there. And so for Keaton Mitchell, you talked about seven, seven yards a pop. And we are at a time where we always talk about you can find a running back at any level of the draft and those things. And it's another example of just being able to find guys wherever. And if you put them in the right system, surrounded by the right players, these running backs can get off. Nine carries, 138 yards, like nine carries. He is able to kind of get it done. And look, with, with, with minimal effort. You love that. And I think what, what you really love, if you're the Baltimore Ravens, and I, like, I'm going to toss this back to you. Yeah. What Mike McDonald has done with this defense. Um, I know look, it, it, he stepped in the big shoes when he was a college coach in Michigan. He went from the Ravens, took over for Don Brown and that defense in Michigan, tidied it up yeah. real quick, cleaned it up, got them going, spends, I think, a year there. Then right back to the Baltimore Ravens as a pro D coordinator. The game couldn't be more different. But what I love about him is it's kind of Bill Belichickian. He takes the scheme and adapts it to the Multiple. individual talents of the players. And so a guy like Calvin Noah, he'll move him in. Hey, you're stand-up edge rusher. Come over to three technique. Yeah. Stand up. Jadavian Clowney, you're a dominant player on the run game, but you're really good on stunts and loops. We'll put you there. Like being able to take, here's my personnel. Let me figure out how to put all of these individual parts in the best uh, position to make plays. And that's going to make our defense better. You talked about this team playing like the early 2000s. They're doing it, but they're doing it in a, such a different fashion than we saw that 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 epic team get it done. Yeah, and and I, I think we're also still, in a way, you know, assessing the adaptation of this offense under Todd Munkin. Like, well, were they going to run it, uh, you know, a bunch like they had in the last, you know, five years, or we're we going to start throwing it a little bit more. Well, we've seen games kind of like you're talking about defensively where they have thrown it around a bunch and Lamar throws for four touchdowns and finds Mark Andrews for two and Zay flowers for one. And, and then the last couple of weeks, Gus Edwards has a hat trick. Keaton Mitchell is going off. And so I, I think again, that they have the ability now to morph um, their offense mm -hmm. into you know, things and ways in which they find to be the most beneficial for potential success against any given opponent, which again is super dangerous. And there the Ravens are seven to two, number two seed in the AFC at this moment. Uh, okay. As for the Seahawks, I don't know if this is just a blip on the radar, uh, but Gino didn't play particularly well. They couldn't run the football again. I think most of the credit just has to go to the Ravens here. You're going from Seattle to Baltimore in the early window. You can make all those excuses. I know the Seahawks won't, mm -hmm. um, but they're still a good football team and they're obviously still, um, you know, a playoff contender there. So I would imagine there are better days ahead in Seattle. Let's go to the Raiders giants game. Raiders. Yeah. Yeah. What? How about that? Oh, it, oh man. Um, that Antonio Pierce, man, um, that, that scene and like that locker room afterwards and the speech he gives and the, mm -hmm. like you're watching Devonte Adams is right next to him, yeah. right next to him as he's yeah. addressing the team after the game. Um, man, this, this felt like exactly what the doctor ordered for Vegas. Okay. So let me say this. I'm a, uh, look, AP is a friend of mine. Uh, having done a bunch of different things. Like we have mutual friends. He was yeah. a high school coach at Long Beach Poly when I was coaching at Notre Dame. Sherman yeah. Oaks. So we never played each other, but very familiar with him and all his people like have worked camps with him or whatever. Great dude. Remember scouting him when he was at university of Arizona before he made his way and became look a, a really solid NFL player. You talk to people at the giants organization when he was there, they always talked about him being an alpha leader. Like just a no nonsense, take charge, say what needs to be said, bring the energy, bring the toughness, bring the grit. What you saw over the course of the week is a snapshot of who he is. And being a guy that grew up in Compton, he embodies what the Raiders are about. 
like anyone who's been around the Raiders organization, like having played there for like a year and some change, yeah. it is all that old mystique, all about the, the outcast, the misfits, the Mavericks. Let's go. They always have a home there. And so for him to embrace that and to, I would say, be completely opposite of what Josh McDaniels is. And I have a ton of respect for Josh McDaniels and all those guys that come out of the Patriot way and that system, but it can be a little negative tone when it comes to how they lead the team and what they harp on and those things. And what I saw from AP leading up to the game and after the game, I saw a guy who is a pro's pro in terms of he understands the pro game in terms of the people. So he gave them what we call Victory Monday. So when you win in the National Football League, some coaches say, hey, we'll see you on Wednesday, meaning they give you Monday off and Tuesday off. Come back. We'll practice Wednesday through Saturday and get it done. That little bone, that little nugget, what it does is the players are like, okay, man, this guy understands the struggle. He understands it. And what I loved about AP is like, look, it ain't about X's and O's. It's about the players. Early in the game, Josh Jacobs got the ball. They tried to make an effort to get the ball <clears throat> to Devontae Adams. You saw, hey, man, look, yeah. my players are better than your players. I'm going to get it to my best players and get it out the way. And it worked. And we'll talk about this because we saw the guy at the East-West Shrine game. I couldn't understand it. Yeah. A, couple, a couple weeks ago, they had an opportunity to start Aiden O'Connell. They started Brian Hoyer. Look, it, it, it backfired. didn't go well. Aiden O'Connell, with his experience, what he did at Purdue, all of us to look the, the dude is, is second behind Drew Brees in terms of 14 300 yard games yeah. at Purdue. Like, I mean, like sometimes in the record book, those things matter. He came in, he was much better than his first start. Like, his start, and even then, I don't think he was that bad. He just took a bunch of sacks. He, he held the ball. Yeah. He was better. They operated well. There was an energy about the Raiders that we hadn't seen in a long time. And so yeah. it was fun to watch from the outside. And AP did a great job. Now, the trick would be. Can you keep it going? Keep it rolling. Can you keep it yeah. rolling? After the emotion subsides, can you find the, the tactical advantages to allow this team to win? But after one week, man, it certainly feels a lot different than it felt when Josh McDaniels was in charge. No doubt. And and good for those players, man. You know, needing something, needing some positivity, and they got it in a big way, um, you know, in the game and then after the game to enjoy it like that. You should celebrate wins in the NFL because they are dang hard to come by. And uh, that was kind of cool to see. Uh, all right, some uh, honorable mentions here before we get out of here. Whew. Uh, Browns defense, hat tip, my friend. Uh, yes, you played a rookie quarterback, Clayton Toon, making his first career start, but you made him look like a rookie <laughs> in a big way. Uh, anything from Rams, Packers, offense, hard to come by there for sure. Yeah, offense hard to come by. I mean, like obviously with the Rams, if they don't have their QB1, they have a tough time kind of moving the ball. And you yeah. just see the lack of depth that this team has when they don't have all their pieces. They just can't get it done. And so it, it showed up. And it is one of the things that they have to kind of figure out. For the backers, look, Jordan Love made some plays. It, it, look, they're still not playing well enough to get back. But the hope is you still got some games left. Maybe you can kind of figure out a way to win some games and put yourself – kind of in the tournament, kind of backdoor in. We'll yeah. see. Defensively, they got enough talent to get it done. The main thing, they got to win. They can build upon it, but they still need to play much better. They got to get more contributions from the running game to help the young quarterback out. Uh, Bears and Saints uh, in New Orleans. Look, I think um, the, this last little stretch of, of really good play from the Saints and wins, um, it's Taysom Hill. It's a recognition that Taysom Hill is your best matchup player uh, all over the place because he can play anywhere, run it, catch it, throw it, whatever. Um, has done it all in the last couple of weeks. And so I think if you look back on this season as the Saints going to the postseason, it's um, it's Pete Carmichael in the Saints offensive staff remembering how dangerous Taysom Hill can be. Um, so I thought that was a big piece of this one. Caught a touchdown in this one. They win 24-17 to 17 despite uh, Tyson Bajan playing pretty well in the first half, giving it away a little bit in the second. Uh, Colts and Panthers, Buck. How about Kenny Moore? Two pick sixes. Unbelievable, man. T talking about two pick sixes, and you just talked about a guy who's a veteran player, super smart player, comes yeah. in, makes some plays. He does that. And I, look, on a day in which C.J. Stroud goes bananas, like Bryce Young has a three-interception uh, effort, and he admitted that he needs to play better. The thing that I'll say about the Panthers, because everyone in Charlotte's going to be down, they're going to wonder, like, man, do we have the right one or whatever? They have to figure out a way to take Bryce Young and put him in the best situation when it comes to his game and those things. We haven't quite seen that. And it's so odd because there's so many quarterback whispers and gurus in that building around. 
They just haven't figured out a way to get it done. And also, I would say the Panthers have been hurt by the expectations. I'll admit, I thought this was a team that might be able to make a playoff run. They're not good enough to do that. And so those expectations have kind of changed the way that we look at the young quarterback. Young quarterbacks are going to struggle. He has to play better. But maybe we put too much on him in this environment to be able to get this team to the winner's circle. Fair point. So the Colts keeping themselves alive. Massive win. Uh, They're on the road in Carolina. Uh, as they move forward. All right, that's going to do it for us here on this Monday recap edition of Move the Sticks. Four more episodes coming your way this week, including our video show tomorrow. We're not sure if DJ is going to be with us, but Bucky and I will hold it down uh, if need be, and we will ridicule DJ for all of his terrible uh, rookie draft picks um, as I am closing (laughs) in on the top spot. Uh, It's always better to do when DJ is not around. Uh, But thanks for being here with us on another episode of Move the Sticks. We will catch you later this week.